Well, good morning, Sturgeon Alliance. We just sang today, uh, I choose to give my life to you. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, or we will serve the Lord. And today, we're in our series on Proverbs. We're calling this Wise Up. And today, we, we are talking about wisdom for family. Wisdom for family. Uh, and it is Father's Day, so, so happy Father's Day. I hope you do something special for your father. Give him a call, buy him something amazing today. Uh, just show value to your fathers today. Well, today naturally is a day that we think about family. So we thought what a great time for us to talk about the wisdom of Proverbs for our families. And so I brought a guest along with me uh, this morning, the best looking person in our church, my wife. Erica, and uh, uh, she's going to help me today because I need lots of help sometimes. I need, I need, especially when it comes to this issue of, of fam, family. And why else are we talking about this? Because of COVID nineteen. Well, yeah, we are in the middle of a pandemic, and COVID nineteen. It's not new news. We a crisis. Yeah, we have definitely heard of it before. Yep. Um, yeah, and and um, there's some positive and negative spin-offs of this um, as as it goes with families. Um, one of the positives is that we get to spend more time together as a family, but also one of the negatives is that we get to spend more time together as a family. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a trade-off there. So yeah, yeah, we find that it's kind of fitting to talk about this. Yeah. Right and so, so maybe that produces another crisis on top of the pandemic <laughs> in your family because you have to spend so much time together. So what better time to talk about family? So this is perfect time for us to talk, talk about family. <clears throat> so one of the things, uh, one of the things that as you read the book of Proverbs, as you've been reading through it, you, uh, we've been asking people to read a chapter a day for a, a month. One of the things, one of the themes that you're going to see over and over in the book of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. In fact, 14 times, 14 times in the book of Proverbs, it mentions the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And there's going to be this one verse that we're going to use today as we talk about wisdom for family from Proverbs that's going to kind of be the crux for all of it. And it's in this, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26, and it says this, Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, <clears throat> and for their children it will be a refuge. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that the, uh, the, that the proverb, you call it the proverb-er, the proverb-est, we call it the psalmist, so we call it the proverb-est, pro whatever. You know, one of the things that the person giving the proverb is using here, he's using this illustration of a of a fortress or, or a city with walls. Now, we, d we don't really think in those terms these days. We don't, Edmonton doesn't have this big wall around it. Calgary doesn't have this big wall around it. But in those days, they, the city had a walls around it and it was for their security and it was their strength. The bigger the walls, the, the, the stronger it was. And the way it was, or, or, or in those days, and you might even know this, that there was forts, there was a fortress and they had big walls and it was for, for their strength. So he's using this illustration of a, of a fortress and this place being a refuge. And so in biblical times, you'd have a city and people would live in the city within the walls, but also people lived outside the walls and, uh, in farms and communities and things. But when an, an army came to invade, or, or, or the, everyone would huddle up inside of this city for security. And it was like they would all come in and it would be this, this, this sigh of relief. Ah, this the security because there's an invading army coming. And so that's the illustration that he's given here. Just think about that with family. Like the family's supposed to be this, this secure place where you come back to it and it's like... Oh, outside it could be dangerous and people are going to attack you and, and things like all these things are going on but you come back into this secure fortress and it's like oh, it's, this, it's a sigh of relief and what is it what is it that brings a sigh of relief what is it that brings that security it's the fear of the Lord it's the fear of the Lord and we're talking about revelation fear of the Lord and I'm going to preach here on revelation we're talking about like holy holy 
Holy is the Lord Almighty. Like, he, like knee-trembling fear where he is God and I am not. Whatever he says goes. I'm not going to come in at co-equal with him. I'm not going to come in like, like give him a high five and say, we're going to figure this out together. No, he says it, that settles it. That's the type of fear of the Lord that we're talking about here. And when that's central in the home, there's security. There's security. Make another proverb says this. I love this one. Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Now, we're not even getting to family, but this is a good sermon for anyone at any time. Blessed is the one who always trembles. Like, like, like anyone in the scripture who ever encounters something from the unseen world is like trembling before the Lord. The blessed, happy are they. Happy are they. You want to have a happy home? The fear of the Lord needs to be central. That's the security. So today, we are talking about how to build your family around the fear of the Lord. How do we build our family? Now, we have not been perfect at it. Uh, and, you know, I'll say this too, because what you, everyone fears something. And what you fear is what you build your life around. If you fear losing relationships, you're going to build your life around it. If you fear losing money, you're going to build your life around it. If you fear losing, if you fear, whatever you fear, you build your life around. And so when you fear the Lord, you're going to build your life around the fear of the Lord. And now we're not perfect at this. Uh, we're, not, we're not perfect at this at all. In fact, uh, I, I can count, we were talking about how imperfect we are, and I count, came up with countless stories. We don't have time to get into countless stories of my imperfection, but we ironically could not find any stories for my wife. And so that's why she's here, because she needs to offset me. I need help. I, 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 need, I need help. Uh, but, but we're not perfect in this. There are many times, and we'll, I'll tell you stories. I, I throw myself under the bus all the time in my sermon, so I don't have to give you any more. But tell them a little bit, uh, a little bit about us, because many sure. people don't realize how long we've been married and yeah, how many kids sure. we have. So on um, July 8th, we will have been married 20 years already. That's which... like in two weeks approximately. Two weeks yeah. or so, yeah. Two or three weeks. So we will have been married for 20 years. 20 that is years. for us. Wow. Yeah. Um, we have been in full-time ministry for 16 of those years. And we have two wonderful children, really, they are a blessing, um, ages 14 and 15. So, yeah, we, we definitely have had our um, experience with family. Not perfect. Not perfect. Not perfect at all. Perfect. But, but we're going to talk about how we see the book of Proverbs instructing us on how to build our life around this security, this, this fear of the Lord. Uh, and so why don't, why don't we throw a few qualifiers in before we jump in? Sure. So Brent and I just really want you to realize that this is not going to be an exhaustive parenting or marriage course. Today is just going to skim the surface of parenting and marriage. We cannot di dive deep. There just isn't enough time today. Maybe possibly in the fall or winter we'll be able to actually provide a marriage or parenting course to you. But uh, this today is just going to skim the surface. Right. And the other qualifier that I'd like to make is that like everything in Christianity, in the way, the discipleship way of following Christ, it swims upstream against all of the cultural values and the, and the messages of the world. And so this may ruffle some feathers sometimes, but that's a good thing. I, I want this to disturb maybe the comfortable and maybe comfort the disturbed, just like the book of Revelation. But, but, but it is going to be swimming upstream against kind of the, the, the progressive culture of our day, some of these things that we're going to talk about. But we're, we're going to jump into this, and we're going to talk about four things, four things that a, that a God-fearing family does according to the book of Proverbs. So the first piece of wisdom that we see in the book of Proverbs for families is this. It's to humbly accept your God-ordained roles. Humbly accept your God-ordained roles. You know, Proverbs assumes uh, this complementarian view, this understanding of marriage and of family, where the husband is the leader, and the wife is the helpmate, the support. This is all from the book of Genesis. And the children are under authority. 
So I'm going to talk about the father's role. We see this in, 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 in uh, chapter 4. He says this, Listen, my son, <clears throat> to a father's instruction, pay attention and gain understanding. It will give you, uh, I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, take hold of my words with all my heart. We see in the book of Proverbs that the father is the one doing the speaking. And the father is saying to his son, listen to your mother. The father's voice is the most powerful voice in the world, in the lives of his kids. The father needs to be the spiritual leader in the home. The father sets the spiritual tone for everything that goes on in the house. And I see that in my own life. I think back, uh, uh, let me illustrate this way. I think back to a few weeks ago when they gave that illustration about the elephants in that uh, conservation park in South Africa. Remember, they, the, the elephants were growing beyond the capacity, and so they took out all these male, older elephants, and all these, these youth juveniles started acting out, doing things that, that elephants normally don't do, acting like gangs. They were, they were sexually promiscuous, well, or they were they're sexually active long before they should have been. They were acting uh, like, like gangs by uh, attacking rhinos and, and, att and running after tourists, and they didn't know what to do. And then, so they, they, they thought of this, this idea before they decided to kill all the juvenile elephants. They inserted <clears throat> older male wiser elephants into this, into this uh, uh, herd of elephants. And almost immediately, the juvenile did behavior stopped. And that shows me that, that a father's voice... A male voice it is, is so important in the life of our family. And I see this in my own life, that I set the tone for my family, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And on this Father's Day, I want to challenge us fathers to accept that role, that God-ordained role of the leader, and understand that, 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 that you have influence, that you are the leader of your home. I wish I could say more on that, but we can't. We're going to talk about the wife's role, the mother's role. Do you sure. want to read the verses? Um, yes. Okay, sure. Um, 12.4. Uh, Proverbs 12.4 says, A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay, decay in his bones. And 14.1 says, A wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears her down. 21.19. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. And 2715, a quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof on a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. Wow. Um. <laughs> oh, there's one more. Oh, yes, a wife, a wife of noble character. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. So some of those verses are pretty harsh about women. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, it, you take it to the heart. But uh, if you read them in the right context, it's not so bad. And, and we can do that. So, you know, um, God created man and knowing and realizing that they would need help. Right? So I'm going to throw men under the bus a little bit here, just so you know. Um, we, we need lots of help. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just be honest, ladies. We have watched our men stand in front of the fridge doors and stand in front of the open fridge um, countless times looking for that bottle of ketchup that is sitting right in front of their face. And this has happened so many times in so many different scenarios. That we, you're we saying just put, we have blind spots. You have blind spots. We just put our hand over our head and shake, and shake our head. Like, what do we, what do, we do with that? Yeah. Um, so some, some men have bigger blind spots than others. <laughs> 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 I have none. None. <laughs> so <clears throat> Proverbs displays this, like Brent said, this complementarian view of the husband and wife relationship. God has given men and women different gifts mm -hmm. to help complement one another. And, and sometimes, just as women, um, we forget and we um, become harsh or nagging about things. Um, but we, uh, in Proverbs, it says that that is very annoying to the husband. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's, it's basically saying because your role yeah. is that support, yeah. is that help, that there's a way that it's supposed to be done. 
Right. And not in a leaky roof, nagging, annoying way, right? Right. Like, right. Yeah. So um, we as women need to make sure that we do our best to support our husbands, that we're not annoying them and nagging them, um, and to be the helpmate that God asks us to be. Mm. Um, it's very clear in Proverbs. And then if I'm just going to challenge women, if you haven't read it, um, Proverbs 31 mm. is um, full of wonderful things about uh, how we should be as women and wives and mothers in our home. And, and I have... A pile of blind spots and you help sh reveal those blind spots in so many ways like she'll be like oh we need to spend more time as a family we need to do this thing as a family she will filter what I say in a sermon sometimes and she'll be like do you realize that when you said that it was like Ugh, you know and I was like I didn't know that and and so uh, um, um, issues with the kids she'll be like oh you got you can't speak that way to your daughter you gotta you can't speak that way to your son you got to do this do that so I have I have blind spots so she she, she's an exemplary model of that uh, non-nagging, non-dripping roof uh, 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 wife. But, but, the, but, but the, the other side of it is, is that the children are under authority. Um, uh, and I know that's inciting nowadays when we try to build our kids up to be, uh, we're supposed to worship them as idols. And uh, um, one of the things that the world says, and this is a subtle message that kind of erodes parents' authority, is that it takes a village to raise a child. And I've heard this over and over again. It sounds like it's right, but they're, they're not, no, no, it doesn't. It, it, uh, there's lots of, as we're seeing on the news today, there's lots of village idiots out there, and I do not want them raising my children. What it takes, according to the Word of God, is a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, in a lifelong committed marriage relationship that love one another with their God-ordained rules, that raise their children, and the children are under their authority. That's what it takes. That's the system that God b built up when he established the nation of Israel. That's the system that God has built up that's going to build a strong and healthy society. It doesn't take a village. Yes, I know. It, 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 there's other people that can speak into your kid's life. But it takes primarily, 99% of it, a husband and a wife and a lifelong caring relationship uh, speaking into their, into their kids. Okay? We should could speak more on that, but we've we got to move on. The second thing that we see in the book of Proverbs for wisdom for families is that a God-fearing family is deliberate with instruction. A God-fearing family is not only hum humbly accepts their God-ordained roles, but is they're very deliberate with instruction, whether they're, as parents they're receiving instruction from older, wiser people or from the Lord, or, or, or they're giving instruction, you know. Uh, there's, there's an interesting proverb, uh, you know when you read it and you kind of chuckle at, like I wonder what was the story behind that, uh, that proverb, why did he write that proverb? There's, there's one in chapter 17 verse 12, it says this, better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool bent on folly. And I often wonder, what was the backstory that led to that proverb? Like who was the guy walking through the woods and he's like a bear robbed of her cubs? Like we all know that means like she means business, she's got nothing to lose, she's going to be destructive if she loses her cubs. And, and he's comparing that to someone, a fool bent on a fool bent on their folly. A fool is anyone who's proud, who will not listen to instruction, who's going to do their own thing no matter what. And he's saying, better to meet someone, better to meet a bear who's, who's this destructive force with nothing to lose than to be than to be meet a fool bent on their folly. And here's the thing: when I read that, uh, uh, every single one of us. Every single one of us, no matter where we are in our family dynamics, can be that bear sometimes. We all can be that destructive force with nothing to lose. That's why uh, we, all, we all can be that fool. Uh, and we're just going to do something no matter what. Uh, that's why we all need to receive instruction. That's all why we always need to, we need to be deliberate with instruction, whether we as parents need to receive it from others and from the, from the Lord, and then we need to be deliberate about, about giving that instruction. 
And, and so uh, we have a lot of verses in Proverbs. Uh, remember the first few chapters in Proverbs, this is a long introduction to get to those little tidbits of information. But how many times in the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs does the father say, listen, my son, listen, my son, listen, my son, to my wisdom and my instruction. Listen to my wisdom and my instructions. He's saying over and over. Here's your example. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. In 1927, he says, stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. 20 verse 11 says, even small children are known for their actions. So is their conduct really pure and upright? So he's basically saying that, they, that the, the heart, the nature of a child is not to do the right thing. And so they need instruction. And the last one, 22, 6 says, start up a ch child off in the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. And that verse is, 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 isn't a promise. It, it, it's a probability that we need to, and, it, and it's telling us that we need to be instructing our children. And there's a good chance that they're going to turn out uh, and then the right path when, when, if, if we do, to be, if we are deliberate with, with our instruction. So parents need to be deliberate with their instruction. You know, the whole book of Proverbs, as I've been saying this, the whole book of Proverbs is... The people of Israel putting into practice what God commanded them to do in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Remember we talked about this at the beginning of the, of the series? He says, these commands and, and laws, the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and your children after them will fear the Lord. That's why I'm giving you these, so that you'll fear the Lord. There's our theme, the fear of the Lord. These commands I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when, when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Basically, all the time, don't start talking about what it means to put God central in your life. Don't stop talking about, don't stop instructing your children in the ways of God. Uh, and so when we see in the book of Proverbs, we see this from chapter 10 to verse chapter 31, this randomness of, of Proverbs. It's like this, this verse is, is an entirely different subject and that verse is an entirely subject because that reflects the randomness of parenting. And so what we as parents are supposed to do, and you'll pipe in here in a sec, is that is that as our kids go about life and we're supposed to purposely be deliberate with instruction and talk about money, talk about hard work, talk about all these things, uh, the words that, we come up, that come out of our mouth, how we're supposed to treat difficult people, how we're supposed to deal with this difficult, station, difficult, difficult situation, uh, how we're supposed to treat our friends, we're supposed to talk about sex, uh, we're supposed we're, we're to talk about all these things. And, and, and we have an example of that. Yeah. We, we bought our daughter a cell phone. Oh, no, that's not the one. one. <laughs> that's a different one. Um, yeah, so I'm sure uh, many of you are going to be, be able to relate to this story. Uh, it's not anything too, um, too awesome, too out there. Um, Leah has come home many times from school, hurt with hurt feelings, upset about something that's happened at school having to do with her friends. And it seemed no matter what she tried to do to fix the problem, she could never, she just didn't seem to have the right tools in her toolbox to actually fix it. Mm. And so um, she was wise enough, thankfully, to come to me and say, I noticed she was upset and she came to me and she said, told me the problems that she was having her, with her friends and I was able to actually instruct her to help her. And now she has those tools in her toolbox mm. to actually fix the problem or help the problems, whatever it is. And as it comes along, you address she, that issue with, that's right. with yeah. instruction. Exactly. Yeah. One of the world's message, and we're going to kind of counter this with some of the world's messages, is that a child's heart is good. Oh, it's good. And I'm not saying that you need to tell a child that they're terrible and awful all the time and you need to be extremely negative. But, uh, uh, but, but you just, oh, they're, they're naturally going to do the right thing themselves. And we encountered this and what, many years ago. You had a friend that was playing with our daughter. And, and... Yeah, so my friend would come over quite often and um, she would, we'd have coffee upstairs while our children played downstairs. They were both the same ages. And she wasn't a believer. She wasn't yeah. a believer, but she was a wonderful friend. And so we... Um, one day we're sitting upstairs and we heard squabbling and it didn't, it wasn't common. It from the kids. From the kids. It didn't yeah. happen all the time. It was just 
it happened, I don't know why, but anyway. Um, so I, I looked at Shauna and I just about got up from my chair and she put her hand on my, uh, her hand on mine and said, Hey, you know what? They'll figure it out themselves. Just let them be and let them try to figure it out themselves. And I kind of sat down and I was like, okay, that's totally not the way I would typically do things. There's toys being thrown There's... through the air, they're yelling and screaming at <laughs> one another. You know, so like, their, their, their hearts are good. They're naturally going to do the right their thing. Their hearts are good yeah. and they'll <clears throat> naturally do the right thing. And so we continued to sit there and the squabbling and fighting continued. And then I got up and went downstairs and... Um, Inst solved the problem. Instructed. Instructed. There you go. And came back upstairs and she said, oh, I guess my way doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing, uh, the, nothing grates on me more than this, is that, that, that we know from the word over and over again, over again that we are born sinners, that our hearts are full of depravity and darkness and sin. And when we are left to our own vices, we are just going to go to some narcissistic self, like, the, like that golem, my precious, that, that's it. And so the kid, people, kids need instruction. Everyone needs instruction at every level of their life. And we need to be deliberate about it. Right. We learn to be good with good instruction. We learn to be good with good instruction. We need instruction in holiness. We need instruction in holiness. So, so we need to be deliberate. Take time out of our days uh, to, to receive instruction from the Lord, but also but give it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you and I, in our early years of parenting, uh, we saw the importance of like, okay, we don't know what we're doing, like most new parents, and we sought a young couple, an older couple in our church, and what'd we do? Yeah, we asked them if they would just kind of mentor us and talk with us about parenting, yeah. to just make, for almost just a bounce, to bounce off our ideas, not so much to help guide us through every step, yeah. but more so to make sure that we were on the right track in raising our Exactly, children. and not someone that was going to just tell us our own worldview and tell us our own preconceived ideas and kind of confirm and coddle us in our own depravity. No, someone's going to kick us in, our own, in the butt. And we chose people in the church that, that we looked up to them and their kids were already following the Lord and they were, they were many steps beyond us. So they, were, they had a longer view of this kind of like reality when our kids were in diapers and so they could kind of speak into it. So, so, so wherever you are as a parent and wherever you are, if your kids have even left home, or whatever, you need to be deliberate about receiving instruction, receiving instruction in, in every area of your life. And that's why you come to the Word. That's why you're listening here. The third thing that we see in the book of Proverbs, is wisdom for families, is that a God-fearing family disciplines because they love. They, they, they discipline because they love. We have a few verses we're going to read here, Erica. Uh, Proverbs 13, 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. 19, 18, Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party in their death. 22, 15, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it away. And 23, 13 to 14, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with a rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. And 29, 15 to 19, a rod reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces his mother. Discipline your children. They will give you peace. They will bring you the light, delight you desire. And that's just a few samplings of this, 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 this important idea of discipline, and it's disciplining because you love. Now, this is this is uh, this is incriminating. This is inciting. I wish I could be in the same room as you when I say this. You can just feel the tension in the room here when we when we talk about discipline, <clears throat> because there's just all this 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 idea. Uh, there's this question out there: of What does it mean to love your child? What does it mean to love your child? Does it mean you buy them all kinds of stuff? Does it mean that you, you wrap them in bubble wrap and protect them from things? That you, that you, that you try to give them every opportunity or that, or that you just want to build their self-esteem? Self what does it mean to love your child? It means disciplining them. It means disciplining them when they step out of line. It says the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Uh, the world's message, though, is, is this. Don't be negative. 
Everyone gets a gold star. No, there's no, there's no wrong thing. It's just, just different. Everyone gets a gold star. Everyone gets a participation ribbon. And your job as a parent is to put a smile on your child's face at any cost. Don't be negative and, and, and put a smile on your child's face at any cost. And we, we encountered this years ago with a friend of ours. Yeah, a friend of ours um, was a nanny. and uh, So she was watching someone else's kids. She was watching somebody else's kids. And this particular family had bought into this idea of um, don't be negative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she was not allowed to use the word no to these children. And so she, I mean, if they were waving a broom in the air, she would have to say broom elsewhere or that's not okay or that's even negative, I guess. But that was the extent of her negativity. That that, that's extent. not okay. But she right. could never, ever say the word no to her children. Right. Um, um, and we see those people on TV lately mm -hmm. uh, when, when they haven't been said, 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 no. Uh, said no to. They're, they're just, no, I'm the victim. I'm always the victim. I've never been told yeah. no. Discipline is, is so important. To not discipline is not to love. Discipline actually flows out of your theology. He, uh, the father tells the son this in chapter 3. Uh, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a son he delights in. And so we recognize that the Father disciplines us and we need to discipline our children. And if, and, and if you don't discipline your children, it means that you don't have this understanding that God disciplines you. You really show your theology in how you parent. And so we do this thing, we call these empowered boundaries and and they're always spoken of in the negative that's why the ten commandments are spoken of in the negative not the positive some people try to rewrite the ten commandments into suggestions or the ten tenderments or or things like that they're they're empowering because they're in the negative do not kill stay within that boundary do not commit adultery stay within that boundary do not bear false witness stay within that boundary and it's like a fence you stay within that fence and it's empowering you step outside of that fence and there's devastation and destruction in your life and so if you think about it as empowered boundaries for your children, God puts empowered boundaries on us, his followers, even as parents, we're under his empowered boundaries, and we need to put empowered boundaries around our children. So, yeah, so this rung true in our family this past week. Um, so we bought our daughter a cell phone only because she's going to pay for the monthly bill. <laughs> We will not pay. Dad will not pay for the cell phone. But she said she's going to pay for it. But we got, so we bought it for her birthday. So she got a cell phone for her birthday. And, and as with all devices in her home, she knows the rules. She's been instructed. We have sat down and taught our children what we expect of them as far as their devices go. Mm -hmm. One of our rules and one of our main rules is that uh, no devices in our rooms at night. Uh, sometimes that can just lead down bad trails. So we decided that that would be a good rule. Well, one night when Brent was heading um, down the hallway, he peeked into Leah's room and she was indeed on her phone. And she had not plugged it in down in the kitchen where we all plug our devices in. And so therefore, um, we had to take her phone away from her for two days. But the very cool thing was, is that she knew she was wrong. And she willingly gave up her phone and did not complain one little bit about the discipline that she received because she, it was consistent. She knew mm. that that would be the punishment. Boundaries are empowering. So, so the, the main message is discipline. A, a, a family that fears the Lord disciplines because they love their children. The fourth and final thing that we see in the book of Proverbs uh, for wisdom for families is that a God-fearing family makes Jesus central. It humbly accepts God's ordained roles, is deliberate with instruction, it disciplines because it loves, but it, uh, it finally makes Jesus central. When you read Proverbs chapter 8, you see that this is talking about Jesus. And when we read uh, we read the Old Testament. We need to read it through Christ's eyes. We need to read it through what's called a Christological lens. And so when we read the book of Proverbs, a good way to do that is to, every time you see the word wisdom, insert the word Christ. And so uh, we're supposed to pursue Christ. So he tells the son, my son, do not let wisdom or let Christ and understanding out of your sight. Don't let him out of your sight. 
this would be how we read it in the New Testament. He says, the beginning of, of, of Jesus is this, get him, get wisdom, get Jesus. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you, embrace her and she will honor you. And it is obvious in the book of Proverbs that we are supposed to do everything we can to get wisdom and hold on to wisdom to make it the most central important thing in our life. And that for us in the New Testament is Jesus. And when it comes to our families, we need to make Jesus the center of all of it. And on the contrary, the world's message to us about this is give kids every opportunity at any cost. Their self-esteem is not the important, most of, or their, their self-esteem is the most important thing. Yeah, so the world will tell us that, that we need to give kids every opportunity that they have and that their self-esteem is the most important thing. Whenever I hear the word self-esteem, I kind of go, okay, uh, self-esteem is a byproduct of something. It's not the, the end goal. It's a byproduct of something. And I'm going to say something maybe incriminating that's going to be nails on the chalkboard for some of you. It's going to create so much tension. Your kid's self-esteem should not be your most primary thing. Their God esteem needs to be the most important thing. Fear God. Make Jesus the most central thing in your life. Not their most central, uh, not their self esteem. You make their self the most important thing, and you have, just turn on the news today, and you're going to see people who have made themselves the most important thing, and they've been told that their self is the most important thing. No, we need to make sure our kids, our lives have a God esteem. And when you have a God esteem, God then gives you his identity. And he gives you your proper way to view yourself through what God says and who you are. And that's the most important thing. And that's misdirected when we make ourself the most important thing or our kid's self the most important thing. No, we need to make sure their kids get their eyes off of themselves, preach it, and on to God and God's esteem. Do I hear an amen? All right, so we have tried to do that. Just pragmatically, we're going to kind of close our time off here. Talking about a few th ways that we've done that by making some priorities. We make Jesus central. First of all, we make prayer a priority in our family. We make prayer a priority in our family. At every stage, we pray before meals when we eat. We pray with our kids. We have prayed with our kids when they were little, before they went to bed. I remember Erica taking the kids to school. She would drive them to school uh, many years ago, and she would pray in the car with them before they would go into the school building. It was huge. I remember our kids, uh, we used to sing our prayers, uh, uh, the camp songs, like the Superman, uh, thank you God for giving us food, thank you God, and then the Johnny Appleseed, oh the Lord is good to me. And so we would sing our prayers when our kids were, little young, were really young, and they didn't know any different, that nobody else didn't do this. And I can remember the kids were real young, and we were in McDonald's Play Place in downtown Moncton, New Brunswick, a huge play place, huge McDonald's. And, and here we are, I bring the Happy Meals and put them in front of the kids, and the kids know we don't eat until we pray. And then all of a sudden, this is a packed play place. All of a sudden, our kids go, oh, and you and I go, oh, no, <laughs> we're going to sing this whole song. And because we don't want to, you know, not model this in front of our kids, and we sing, and the Lord is good to me. And it was like straight out of a movie. The whole place went dead silent, and we said, Johnny Appleseed, amen. Man, and then everyone just kind of goes, huh? Like, but our kids knew that prayer was important. Prayer was a priority. Talking to God about everything going on in our lives and making set times in our days to pray to Him. What other things have we done, dear? Um, so we have made um, having godly friends a priority mm. um, in our lives and in our children's lives the best that we can. And... Um, and that means, um, doesn't necessarily mean not having unsafe friends. Right. Because um, we do have unsafe friends. But it's a lot. Pastor Josh talked about that last week, yeah. Yes, but, yeah, we need to be that light to them. Right. But it's when that light gets puffed out by those unsafe friends that it becomes very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then you get drawn away um, from the Lord. And so that's what we don't want for our children. So just as uh, we make prayer a priority, we need to be praying for our children's friendships and for our own friendships, that um, God will just um, 
have friends come into their lives that will help build that family fortress that we talked about mm. in Pro earlier in Proverbs and um, that won't take away from it. And be that godly friend yeah. in those relationships as you right. were talking about how you do with Leah. What's, and, the, and the next thing here. And yeah, so, so we need to make service a priority, a serving a priority. So whether that's in your church or in your community, however it looks for you, um, we need to make sure that we are modeling to our children that others come first sometimes, mm. always, but others come first when we're serving especially. And um, just as Mary, the mother of Jesus, pondered these things in her heart when the angel appeared to her and told her that she was going to have a son, um, Jesus, and that um, just as she pondered those things in her heart, we as mothers, we ponder, we wonder, what is God, how is God going to use our children in his, for his service? Mm. And so a mother has a really good insight into like the spiritual gifts of their children. And right. she can see kind of the waters of their heart and where they're going and which direction and what they're good at. And so a mom, especially, my mom especially, was great at, 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 at instilling that into me. Like, you, you're gifted at this. Because yes. women, they ponder these things in their heart. Mothers, they do. Uh, and, uh, and so we need to make sure that serving is a priority. And our kids... Uh, uh, have a spiritual gift and they're employing their spiritual gift in the church and then serving in their community. It's a gift in the church and then serving their community as well. That's big in Proverbs. But, but looking after those who, don't, who can't look after themselves and, 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 and helping those who can't help themselves. So that's big. And being that others focused. Others focused, yeah. And, and another thing that we do is, is we make church a priority. We make church a priority. And I know this may be uh, inciting to some, uh, but, but we just think that this is, the, this is the eternal kingdom. This is the eternal community that you're going to be part of, despite all the hobbies and little things that are going to come your way, whether it's a sports that you're going to do for a year or two or whatever, that, is, is that we need to make church a priority. If you don't make church a priority of gathering together with a body of believers, you're going to be like that, like that coal that goes out uh, from the fire and it just kind of extinguishes. But we need to bring that coal back to the fire and it gets hotter again. And I can never forget when I was a youth pastor and there were a few years in my church in Moncton, this, this father came up to me and he was concerned because his two boys wouldn't, didn't want to come to church on Sunday. And I just, everything within me wanted to just go, you modeled it for him. You were involved in this in the winter and this all summer. And there was like a few fragment Sundays throughout the year. And you couldn't drag their carcass to church because it never was a priority for them. Everything else in the world was a priority. But coming to church wasn't a priority for those few Sundays that you wanted them to come. And I vowed I've never wanted to do that. And I, we grew up in homes where, where church was a priority. We just, it, it's Sunday, we're, we're going to church. And, and, and so let me encourage you to do that, to make Jesus central, to make going to church a priority. So these are four things, four things. A God-fearing family humbly accepts God-ordained roles, is deliberate with instruction, disciplines because they love, and makes Jesus central. Well, and I just want to close us off here by just... Just giving a word of encouragement, because sometimes as parents you feel like, uh, in the family, like you're not getting it right. You're not making Jesus, you're not making God the center of, of your family. Uh, uh, but uh, I just want to leave us with some, some encouragement here. Uh, I remember when my son was really small, he was Caleb, he was about four years old. And uh, he said, Dad, I, I want to play with you today. I want to play. Uh, I, said, I was like, okay, what do you want to play? I go downstairs and he says, I want to play God. And I was like, okay, what, 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 do, you, what, do, you want, what do you want to play? Because uh, I was like wanting to kind of foster this along. Like, what, what, what do you mean we're going to play God here? He says, yeah, I want to play God. I said, well, why do you want to play God? And he held out his arms like this. And this is a, this is a four-year-old. And he goes, well, well, you see, I make a really good cross. And I was like, in one sense, I was like, this is amazing because even at such a young age, the gospel, the gospel was starting to take root in his life. And he understood there's a God and it has something to do with the cross. And it was Jesus. He was dying on the cross. And he may not have fully understood the full aspects of salvation, but it was starting to take root in his life. And I savored that moment. I did. Because amongst all of the moments that you have as a family where you don't get it right, you need to savor those times where it is starting to take root in your life. 
where this whole God-fearing family is starting. You need, you need to savor those. So let's remember our verse. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. My prayer, and our prayer is, is that you would build your family around the fear of the Lord, and it would be that secure fortress. It would be a refuge. It would be a security. It would be a place where you come back and go, ah, your family. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for each one of our families that that are represented this morning. Thank you for how you are working in their lives and thank you for what you're doing in each one of them. Lord, I pray that you would continue to show us what it means to build our family around the fear of the Lord. That you would use us to make your name famous in our church and in our community. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings.